Painting and Travel's next destination is America's oldest city, St. Augustine, Florida. Sarah learns the history of the Castillo while Roger sets up his easel with a large canvas and captures a scenic view of the historic fort. Castillo de San Marcos National Monument. Here's a bird's eye view of the fascinating fort started by the Spanish in 1672. There's one main entrance into the fort, across the drawbridge and through the Sally Port passageway, where we'll meet a park ranger after Roger gets started on his painting. Well, it's a beautiful morning and I'm going to paint this fort here. It was windy the other day and I came over and I sketched this a little bit just to get a head start. Now I got my paints out and we'll get started. What I did to begin with is tone my board so to get rid of all that white on there. Sort of a warm green color. Now I'll just take some uh, of my earth colors and some of my cerulean blue and we'll just lay in some of these areas of the fort. And I'm just going to uh, put this on rather thin to begin with. And as I go along, we'll get that paint thicker and thicker. But this would just sort of be a base coat just to get these values correct. Now earlier the uh, shadows were up here on the side of the fort and now they've dropped down but I'm gonna put those up a little higher and I'll probably have to come back tomorrow as well and finish this painting because I know the light is gonna change and it's a fairly large painting so I won't be able to do this all at once before the light changes so much that, that I won't be able to really continue. And I'm just gonna start with my darks first as I usually do I'm not going to put any white in there, at least not yet. That shadow sort of makes a nice pattern up here in the wall because basically this fort is basically just a big coquina wall. And uh, this will give it some interest, these shadows. At least that's what I'm hoping. There's this big wall right here. And right offshore is the uh, bay in the Atlantic Ocean. And then we have that shadow that is cast from the wall all the way out here. I'll just stay with this cerulean blue and burnt umber for a while. And we have some cannons right here in the foreground. Really didn't get those cannons drawn in very much. And I'm not going to worry about all the shapes of these cannons yet. I'm going to approach this as one sort of large mass here. I guess what I'm trying to do at this stage is just establish some overall patterns. I guess I'll dip into a little bit of green and my ultramarine blue. These are acrylics and boy, these paints are drying very fast out here in the sun. And I bring my atomizer with me and that helps keep them wet just a little bit. I can also spray my canvas here and that'll help these paints to flow onto the uh, canvas a little bit quicker and a little bit easier. Right up here, we have some palm trees. Just blocking these in as large shapes. I'm not really approaching these palm trees as palm trees. I'm just kind of approaching them as large shapes. Won't put any detail in here whatsoever right now. Just trying to get these large masses, sort of establish the whole pattern of the painting. Well, now that I've got those darks in, I think I can start with the light. And it's a very brilliant 
blue sky today. There's no clouds in the sky at all. I'm going to take cerulean blue and white, maybe add just a touch of yellow ochre to that to give that a bit of warmth. And I'll just cut around my uh, shapes here, shapes of the fort. And these palm trees, of course, I'm not worried about those at all as far as the details in those palm trees yet. Still trying to get these shapes established. And I'll just cut in around these palm trees. And I can vary the colors of this sky somewhat. And I'm sure some clouds are going to pop up later. So if I want, I can put some clouds in there. And I'm just going to touch in a few little negative areas in here in these palm trees. It's just where that sky is sort of popping through there. All right, the color of this wall is a little bit hard to determine. Um, it's sort of a warm gray color. I think I'll make it a little bit darker to start with, and then I'll put my lights over it. So still at this point, it's just a matter of building this up and trying to get the, the right values. So I won't lay this paint in here very heavily because I might want to change these values as I go along. So I'm just going to lay this in here rather, rather light. And I can go over these shadows again. Just put those in there mainly to get a placement of them. And we'll continue with this wall right over on this side. Put a little warm burnt sienna in there. Have those couple shadows. I'm just going to paint right over those shadows for right now. And then we have the wall coming out here. And this is part of the seawall. And then right here, this is the top of this large wall right to the right of me. And right here we have the water. So I'll add a little blue on that. So let's move down to this area where we have the, uh, the dirt. And it's really about the same color as the wall. Not much difference. There's a difference in texture, but there's not much of a difference in color. This is just sort of building the foundation to the painting. The cannons right here. It's sort of a regular shadow coming down from the wall. See, these are all large shapes at this point. This wall here and this shadow, one big shape. I'm not differentiating between those yet. I will be later on. Now, since I toned this board earlier with this greenish warm color, some of this can show through here, even on the final painting. And it's just so much easier for me to work on a, uh, a board that's, uh, or a canvas that's not pure white. Even this shape here, this large shape of the wall and the earth underneath it. See, I'm just going to make that, blend that into one large shape there. So this wall goes here and the earth right goes out from below it. For me, it's very important to get these large areas done first. It can really establish the whole mood of the painting. Because a lot of times the uh, mood of a painting doesn't really rely on the detail as much as it does these large shapes. All right, now let's continue on. Got the large shapes done. So that, that part's over and done with. Mix some green here. And that green grass appears to be slightly darker than the wall. And there's a lot of traffic that goes through here, a lot of foot traffic and so on. So a lot of this uh, is trampled down. So we have some grass right under these cannons. Now, as you can see, the shadows have really changed from when we were here. These shadows are almost gone, and since it's all covered now, I can start with the detail. And I can just build up on these thin layers that I applied to begin with. I guess we'll start over here on this wall. I'm going to take a bit of blue because this is this wall, of course, is in shadow, and uh, that means most of the light that it's getting is either from the ground or from the sky, or a combination of both. So I'm going to 
make this slightly cooler by scumbling some blue over the top of this. I guess I might as well put the uh, trunks to these palm trees in here. And yeah, we got a large trunk that comes right down here and kind of curves in. Yeah, a few smaller ones in the back. Now this loose brushwork that I applied earlier really is of some benefit because uh, it has given me some texture in here. And I think with a few other strokes, texture I have in here already will uh, just help to indicate the, the look of this wall. Pick up some green now. Towards the bottom of these palm trees, it's usually warmer because these leaves are starting to die off. And then up towards the top, they become more green, sort of a yellow green. And I'm just flipping this out, sort of holding my brush straight out, flipping that brush outward. Not too difficult to do, these palms, if I look at them as one large shape. I try not to look at these palms as individual palm fronds, at least not yet. I still try to keep this large round shape. And the outside of this form, in other words, the edge of the form is the most important part. Inside here, this is not nearly as important as far as the detail goes. What's most important is the outside edge of these forms. That's what gives this palm tree its real description. Now there are some spaces right here in between these palms. So we'll put some more negative areas in there. These negative areas are important to get the right shape going in here so they don't just look like a bunch of splotches of paint. All right, some uh, lighter green I think is in order at this point. And we'll put some of these accents up here with this lighter green. I'm going to continue painting for a while, but we're going to stop filming because there's some noise over here with some equipment. But uh, we'll pick this up in a little while. Welcome to the beautiful city of St. Augustine, Florida. This is one of the most visited forts in North America. And Greg Utek is a park ranger here who can tell us about the park. First of all, about how old is this fort? This fort is 344 years old. This is the oldest masonry fort in North America. Within the oldest city, continuously inhabited European city in North America, 451 years old. And I see it has a, a wonderful look to it. This is from the native stone? Yes, ma'am. It's called coquina, which translates into something similar as tiny shells. Extremely strong, roughly 18 feet thick at the base and roughly 9 to 12 feet thick at the top. It's experienced a number of battles, a number of sieges, countless number of skirmishes. It has never, ever fallen in battle. It has withstood the test of time. Coquina, only found in four places in the world, Australia, New Zealand, Cuba, and our own Anastasia Island, our local quarry. I wonder how they got it over here. <laughs> it's a very interesting story. So we can say that it's approximately a million and a half, a million and three quarters years old. It was literally the bottom of the ocean at one time. Eventually, the uplifting of the landmass becomes the surface of the earth. And the Spanish actually came upon it by accident. And when they finally discovered it and chose to use it, they would cut these large, large blocks out of the ground. They would barge them over here across the bay. They'd lay them out in this hot sun for up to three years to dry. All that water will now percolate out of it, replaced by air pockets. And then you and I start to cut and shape and hone each and every one of these 400,000 plus blocks until you finally see somewhat of what we have here today. The fort is a beautiful shape, a wonderful design, and I, I'm sure it has a purpose. Each point, each um, opening has a purpose. Yes, ma'am. It's referred to as the Vauban design, who was a French military architect and engineer. And this style or the shape is somewhat similar to many in Europe. And it is a simple square and the four diamonds in the corners called the bastions, interlocking fields of fire. There's no blind spots whatsoever. 
We never really went on the offense. It was a matter of protection. It was a matter of survival, willing to protect our families and our way of life, our culture and our lifestyle. So the Spanish did come here in 1513 initially, and Pedro Menendez is the one that actually founded St. Augustine, and he arrived here on November 10th of the year 1672. The fort was established for protection of this area and for the beautiful city of St. Augustine. And I see lots of cannons. Did they really have a lot of firepower? They had an enormous amount of firepower. We are in a defensive position, if you will, but we have the responsibility to go ahead and protect ourselves, protect the colony, and of course, protect the gold and the silver fleet as they transit the Bermuda Channel. We would call that the Gulf Stream today. So we do have an enormous amount of firepower. And at one time, this fortification had the ability to hold 77 cannons all the way around. If we were attacked by sea, and or by land, we would be able to protect ourselves, our families, and our colony. And well, how far can a cannonball go? That's dependent upon the size, but this cannon right here, this has a range of approximately three miles downrange. Some of the smaller cannons, a range of a mile and a half, which is the distance from where you and I stand here today to where the lighthouse is displayed upon the horizon. I am shocked to hear that. Uh, and this is from black powder. Well, black powder is a compound that will actually burn very quickly. It creates a lot of pressure, and it actually expels the ball out of the muzzle, pushes it at nearly the speed of sound. I am very impressed to hear that. I also noticed in one of the brochures I was reading that they have an oven, which is not for bread. <laughs> it's for heating cannonballs? Yes, ma'am. It's referred to as the hot shot furnace and was installed by the U.S. Army. U.S. Army occupied this from 1821 until the year 1900. And I believe it was the 1840s, they built the hot shot furnace, made a few other modifications. You would take a solid iron projectile, a cannonball, you would fire it up red hot. Special loading sequence. Of course, anything that it touches, you're gonna poke a hole in it, but you're also gonna catch it on fire rigging, sails, the wooden ship themselves, vegetation. So they take tongs or something and lift these red hot cannonballs into the cannon, fire it with the idea that it's going to land on a wooden ship and set it on fire? Yes, ma'am, exactly. And I'm wondering about the soldiers who worked here. Um, did they spend the night here or did they have shifts? Did they go into town? It's a great question. So realize that we live within the colony and we never live within the fort here. It's kind of like a modern day firehouse is today. We would come here 36, 72 hours. We stand our military duty and we simply go home to our families and our lives. I see, so they come for their shift, they do whatever their work is, and then they go back to the walled city and spend the night. Exactly. So yes, we are a military fortification, but we're primarily a warehouse. I refer to it as the Costco or the super Walmart of the day. We store supplies here, and then we, we as in the, our colony and the, our fellow soldiers, members of the garrison, and our families would come here during times of battle and siege if and when necessary. Considering the age of this fort, there must have been a time when it was in disrepair. Who makes the decision to repair the fort and uh, turn it into such a wonderful place for visitors to come? Of course, we are owned and operated by the American people, specifically the Department of the Interior and my employer, the National Park Service. And our mission is simply to preserve and to protect for current and for future generations. So we do have the responsibility and the entrance fees that are collected here actually go right back into the maintenance and the repair and the upkeep of this fortification. Well, this is day two, and I did work on this painting a bit more when that equipment was so noisy over here. So I'm gonna get started again. One thing about this painting is these walls are so big, there's very little to tell anybody what the scale is on these wall. So I've uh, taken some charcoal here and I've sketched a few people in here. It's not too many people around right now because it's early in the morning, but later on in the day there's lots of people in here. So I'll sketch those in with charcoal and just with a small brush we'll just indicate a few people there. Okay we'll just, see I don't want to spend too much time here. The wind is also picking up. So I'm just going to indicate these few folks here. 
And I'll probably just use the same sort of a dark color to begin this. And then maybe later I'll add a few little details of uh, some lighter or darker shades with the shirts and so on. Another person here. And that also just gives some human interest to a painting like this. Without that, uh, the painting will just <laughs> lack some uh, human, a human touch, you know. And a few more people up here looking over these walls. And maybe one or two more down here. And even though these are just sort of specks, little body and a little head on it, it does uh, show that there are some people there and it does indicate some scale to the painting, which I think is kind of important. I'll mix some bright green here with some chromium oxide green and cadmium yellow. And put a few more of these bright colors in these palm trees just for accents. Now, as I said earlier, I don't want to destroy the large shape on this, but uh, I do want to show some variation. And since this is a nice morning sunlight, we've got a lot of warm light coming in, hitting the tower and these trees. And then, of course, we've got a lot of cool shadows. Now, I did work on this a bit yesterday, but uh, going to accentuate the trunks of these trees even a bit more. And on this side of the trunk, this is very blue because all the light that's on this side of the trunk is, is being lit by the sky, which is very blue today, as it was yesterday. So we put a lot of that blue cast in there. And without some of these brilliant colors, this painting becomes very, very dull. But uh, so I'm sort of pumping up some of these colors. I'm pushing them a bit just so uh, the painting will have a little bit more life. Take this Indian yellow and some white, and that's right on the side here. This is where the sunlight is hitting that palm tree out there where the sun is rising over the Atlantic. And same here on this wall. We've got some really bright sunlight coming in and hitting that wall. So that'll add a much needed accent to this piece because all this painting is is very gray. There's not too much life as far as color goes as far as this wall. So in order to compensate for that, I really need to do something with the sky, these accent colors with the highlights and the shadows. So that'll give a nice combination of colors, the cool colors and the warm colors here. You know, maybe I'll pick up a, a bright red color and we'll add just a bit of color on this shirt. Something like that's really called a foreign note of color. As I was thinking about this painting yesterday, as I was working on it, that's the one thing it did lack was just, just a matter of some nice colors. Now on this wall here, we have a lot of areas where these stones were put together. And I did some of these yesterday, but I'm going to accent a few more of, of these. Because some of these are a lot lighter than other areas where this, uh, not sure it was cement, maybe it's cement, whatever it is, holding these things together. So it makes a nice pattern across here. So I think what I want to do here is just bring out a little more of these details. People love detail in a painting, and of course that really is what makes the painting interesting. So to accentuate some of these details in here that I think are important is almost necessary. And it's really... Sort of the fun part of a painting is to add details like this. Now back in this area, I'm not going to see as much of these fine little lines as I am here in the foreground, but there are a few. So I'll take this brush and let's add a few more of these lines back here, but these are going to be quite faint. I don't want these to come forward and be in as much detail as these here. So these will sort of be pushed in the background. You won't see those quite as much. I really got the wind coming up here. I'm trying to hold my board here a little bit too, my uh, canvas. And over here, I don't know whether this area here is where the wall has been patched or what, but uh, we do have some interesting 
areas up in here where the looks looks to be re-cemented or something. So that gives some extra added patterns to this wall. I like that. I need to spray my paints quite often. I use this atomizer to do that. Keeps them wet for a little bit longer. Spray the painting too. By spraying the painting, it doesn't help keep the paint wet on this painting. It, what it does is it helps for any additional paint I put on there, it helps it just to flow on a little easier, a little quicker. Just gives the canvas a slight bit of lubrication where the paint just slides on, glides on nice and easy. One way to bring attention to an area is to have a lot of lights against darks. And let's put some good contrast right down here in this area where the sand is. That gives a lot of good contrast, light against dark, and that will help to establish that focal point and center of interest in the painting. And I'll add a bit more right back in here. Really punch that up. Yeah, these light areas really begin to focus the attention into this area. You know, it's funny on a, on a painting, uh, I struggle with it and it's just not coming to life as I, as I want it to. And then if I'm persistent, keep at it. And if I'm lucky, sometimes a few touches, just like these lights against the darks, will really bring the painting to life with just those few strokes. And that's what I'm always looking for in a painting. Just those few last touches that will bring the painting to life. Well, I think these highlights have brought this painting to a finish and the wind is picking up and I want this to blow over. So it's a good time to stop. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.